Today will be a day to remember for the rest of your life. The Pro Football Hall of Fame is excited to present the heart of a Hall of Famer program connected by Extreme Networks. With over 100 Hall of Famers participating, we have reached 47 states and countries all over the world, sharing the message that football is more than a game and can teach Americans important life values like commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and honesty. But you have to make right decisions even when nobody's watching you. Well, respect is not just given out. It's not handed out like a, like a, like a brochure. It's earned. Today, you are presented with an opportunity to meet and learn from one of the greatest football players of all time. But more important than that, the chance to see that their Hall of Fame life wasn't given to them. They didn't roll out the bed great. They put the work in, on the field, in the weight room, in the classroom, in their communities. They made themselves a Hall of Famer on and off the field. Your feet can't take you where your mind's never been. Because you can make it, but it's just going to take a little hard work and some effort and a drive and determination. And today, you will learn you can do the same thing they did. You don't have to have a gold jacket or a bronze bus to make a difference in the lives of others. It's your decision whether you want to be a successful student, son, daughter, brother or sister. If attitudes are contagious, is your attitude worth catching? It's integrity as well because when you decide to pursue something and you don't quit, that says a lot about you. Commitment to excellence. We can all aspire to be the best. Welcome to a once in a lifetime program, the heart of a Hall of Famer program connected by Extreme Networks. You know, I once heard someone say that the brain is like a switch. If you believe you are something, you embody it. You embody that feeling, that thought. You start to move differently, think differently. Success in life is about having a proper belief system. You got to believe in who you are. You must believe in yourself. There were so many other people that believed in me too, and I can't stress the importance of that. You got to have people that are cheering you on along the way. But none of that matters if you don't believe in yourself. To get to this moment, I had to believe in myself and I had to believe in myself a lot. So my, in, in, in closing, my message to everybody tonight, we're all here to sacrifice our lives for the sake of others. Some sacrifices can be as small as paying for someone else's coffee or as great as risking your life for your country. No matter where you fit on that spectrum, I encourage each and every one of you to start with a small but great practice of believing in yourself. You can't wait for somebody else to validate your purpose. You have to believe in yourself. You can't wait for somebody else to tell you that you're great. You have to believe it yourself. You can't wait for society to tell you you're beautiful or that you're a good person. You have to believe that for yourself. I thank each and every one of you for believing in me and my dreams. Because of you, my legacy lives on. Thank you for this incredible honor. God bless. Be. Those values are very, very important on 
and off the football field. And we're going to hear how those values impacted our special guest's career, career today, both on and off the field. And before we bring him on for some opening remarks, I do have some quick thank yous we'd like to pass out. First and foremost, I'd like to thank our great partners at Extreme Networks for everything they do for us here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. They would, without their support, this program for all of our students here, as well as everybody watching us live on YouTube, uh, could not take place. So we want to thank them for all their great support for this program over the, over the years. Secondly, I'd like to thank our teachers, administrators, educators, anybody that either brought their students here today or are watching us live or watching us six months from now. Uh, we thank you for allowing us to be a, such a small part of your students' learning experience. And then lastly, have to thank the students. Uh, I know without you guys, this program doesn't take place. I always joke, I've got a bunch of questions here in my hand. Nobody wants to hear me talk for the next hour. This is the opportunity for you to ask questions. I know we've got some awesome students picked out in the back of the room already who are going to be asking some questions. But don't take this for granted. It's not every day you get to hear from a Hall of Famer uh, talk about their career both on and off the field. So thank you for everything, uh, for being here today. Thanks for watching online. Um, if you're using social media today, whether you're taking pictures when you're touring, taking pictures here, make sure to tag at ProFootballHOF, at Extreme Networks, and use the hashtag HOFValues. Our social teams out there looking for those tweets and posts so you, your tweet and uh, or post just might be reshared today so as i said this program not only be hosting it live here in canton ohio it's also being live streamed to our youtube audience so if you're watching us on youtube you're in your classroom or you're a fan and you have a question go ahead and put that in the live chat we've got that uh live chat being monitored for questions and if, if you ask a question we'll try our best to make it a part of the program today um so with that being said, I am now proud to welcome a 15-season NFL vet, 53 career interceptions, and 203 games played, a five-time Pro Bowler, a Super Bowl champion, and a Hall of Famer. Please welcome Hall of Famer Ty Law. All right. How are you guys doing? Right. Well, first and foremost, uh, I'd like to welcome you back to your second home here in Canton, Ohio. Got that beautiful bronze bus down here. Okay. That look like me, guy? A little bit. He do a good job? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, it's always interesting to me, um, you know, coming back to Canton. You know, you get to take play, part in the huge enshrinement uh, ceremony. But what's it like walking back through that front door? No pressure. You already got the jacket, already got the bust. What, what's it like to walk back through, come back here to Canton, Ohio? I mean, it's always, it's always good to come back, especially when you don't have the, uh, you know, pressure of being a new enshrinee because everything, you know, when you walk in and you see your face on the side of the building, you know, all, all that time. So it's somewhat, you know, uncomfortable. I mean, it's all the hoopla built around it, but it's something that we've, I've always dreamed of growing up in, you know, hour and a half from here in Aliquippa, Pennsylvania. I always wanted to become a Pro Football Hall of Famer. Even before I understood what it took to become a Hall of Famer, my uncle um, was a longtime Hall of Famer, Tony Dorsett. So I was always chasing in that shadow and chasing him. You know what I mean? So to finally be here and be a part of this uh, um, prestigious fraternity is awesome. But to come back now when it's like, hey, you can go in and see your bus and just enjoy the Hall of Fame without all the hoopla of enshrinement, which I understand what we have to do to go through it because it is a big deal. It's a lot more comfortable coming back doing this, talking to you guys, and just feel like I'm coming home. Awesome. Well, we can't. We're, we're so happy to have you back here at your second home here at the Hall of Fame. Um, mentioned our five values at the beginning, commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and honesty. Of those five, is there one that sticks out to you as more important than the others, or are they like a team, kind of everything plays together, and all five are super important? I mean, all five are super important, but I will say – if uh, commitment is key, you know, uh, whatever you, you decide to do in life, because it's not always going to be smooth. It's not always going to be, hey, this is what I want to do. You're going to have those ups and downs, but you have to commit to something. And whatever that is, you have to stay with it, because believe me, whether it's in uh, uh, your personal or professional life, you know, you, you, you're going to have some ups and downs. So commitment has always been key in order for me to you know, have success both on and off the field, I had to be committed to, to the plan. You know what I mean? So whatever happened in between there, stay with your ultimate goal, stay committed. And that's how I became a, a, a pro.
Pro Football Hall of Famer. That's how I was successful in business, even when business was 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 down. Hey, I had to stay committed to the to the fact that we're, where we're trying to go, and that's how I was able to uh, exit successfully in my first business, uh, w which I sold um, a few months ago, a few years ago. So you just heard it right there. You know, it took my my next question was going to be, you know, how can you compare to that to, to using commitment on and off the field? And you heard it right there. So you're looking at a Hall of Famer who has succeeded at the the top, you know, individual success level in the game of football, showing how value important those values are, both on and off the field. So with that being said, we're going to open it up for some student yeah. questions. So whoever's up first back there, don't be shy. Don't be shy. We go we, ahead and we step can talk up about to the anything. microphone Let's there. Go. All right, there we go. There's our first. Go ahead and state your name the school you go to, and then go ahead and ask your question. Go ahead, go ahead. We got you, we can hear you. My name is Corey Thompson, and I attend High School. And the question I have for you today is, is there a player in the game today that you think reminds you of the way you played? Mm, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. I see some uh, uh, similarities in certain players, but you understand the rules are different. And I always say, if I played today, I probably wouldn't get no check. I get fined, <laughs> you know, because I mean, I, was a, I like to hit people. So you can't really do the same things now uh, that you did when I played, you know, as far as the pass interferences and stuff like that, and just the physicality of the way I, I was taught to play the game. But um, someone, I look at Stefan Gilmore. He's, uh, he's one of those guys that you know, he can, he can pick the ball off. He can play physical. He can run with anybody. He might not be known for his top end speed. Neither was I. I was never looked at as a, a Deion Sanders type of speed or a, or a Champ Bailey. But I played the game a certain way. So I think, you know, being physical, aggressive, I would say Stephon Gilmore fits the mold that can kind of blend in any way, anyhow that he needs to cover, whoever he needs to cover. So Stephon Gilmore, I'm a big fan of his. So, you know, you mentioned there how, you know, the game has changed, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but what excites you about the game that you see every Sunday, Monday, Thursday on, your, on the TV or in person? What excites you most about the NFL today? Is it, is it the, the players? Is it, are you watching the corners every oh, play? Yeah, are you, are yeah. you watching? Are you just, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm just a fan. Are you critiquing like, oh, I see what he did wrong there? You can't help but critique, uh, you know, as a player. You know what's going on. So I, I'm a fan of just the NFL as far as, how they're going about their business, you know, as far as keeping the guys healthy. You can play a lot longer and make a lot more money for a longer period of time what they're doing to, to protect players. But at the same time, you know, it's kind of contradicting. I'm like, is that football? I mean, how are you going to not hit him if he touched the ball? You know what I mean? You can't wait till he gets two, two feet on the ground before you, uh, you know, Take, take a shot at that. So that's that's different. So I'm always interested in the new nuances and, 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 the, and the way the game is being refereed. You know, I love the points that's being put up, these new dynamic quarterbacks that can run, which is different from when I'm playing. You've seen more and more guys like the Patrick Mahomes, the, the Lamar Jacksons, and they're changing, you know, the way we see the quarterback position, the way we uh, play football, the way defenses are being called. So that chess match between guys like that who's actually changing the game from an a individual and a positional standpoint is always interesting to me. All right, we're going to go to our next question from our students in the back. So go ahead and step up. Like I said, state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead and ask your question. Hi, my name is Elijah Gervins. I also attend Akron North High School. And the question I would like to ask you today is, what excites you most about the future of the NFL? And what is one thing you'd like to see changed? So right off top of you, we've talked about obviously what we see now. You just talked about how, you, how you've seen it change from when you played. What's that next step? What's that next thing you, that really excites you about the future of the league? And is there anything that you might want to see changed? You know what? I like the direction that they're going. It's always, um, you know, something new is, you know, after the owners' meetings and the officiating meetings, it's like how are they going to, what are they going to do to enhance the experience you know, of the game and, and with the product that you put out on the field. But, you know, the one thing that I, I have to say, and I'm a little biased being a, a defender, you know, is they have to change this roughing, you know, the, the, the quarterback or the, some of the pass interference and things like that. I, I really don't agree with that. You know, I know you guys, uh, what was that, Brookside? Y'all colors red, right? 
You know what y'all look like right now? A bunch of quarterbacks at practice. <laughs> a bunch of quarterbacks at practice, because that's what they wear the red shirt. That means you can't hit them. So it's like they're in the game. You can't hit them either because they got the red shirts on because, you, you know, it's like off limits. Do not touch the quarterback or you might get fired. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think they need to change that because this is, uh, you know, football. We know we signed up for. I understand, you know, protecting the quarterback, but I would like to see that change and say, hey, you can't be as lenient just because they play that position. And that's, I think it's not fair to the guys that's rushing the passer where they end up, you know, getting suspended or for a play or losing money because, you know, they, they hit the quarterback. So I would definitely like to see that change. Shout out Brookside uh, up here. Front. I just want to shout out all the other schools that we have in <laughs> attendance today. We've got Howland High School. You heard from some students at Akron North High School, uh, Kenmore Garfield, Wade Park School, Brookside Middle School, McKinley High School, Yeshiva High School, Mifflin High School, and then Hundred High School all the way from Hundred, West Virginia. Wow. So we got some, some yeah, out-of-staters okay, in okay. here in, in awesome. the house as well. Um, so, you know, you're looking back on your career, um, you know, going through playing for the Patriots, playing for some other teams at the <clears> end of your career. Uh, you know, you played for two pretty well-known head coaches in, in Bill Parcells and Bill Belichick. What was that like? You know, obviously, you know, Bill Parcells is a Hall of Famer. I don't vote. I have a pretty good assumption that uh, Bill Belichick will have a bust here one day. Right. Um, what, what was it like playing for those two coaches? Similarities, differences, and the overall impact they had on you, not only as a player, mm -hmm. but as a man, too. You know what? Uh, they, they are two totally different people, and one, you know, I don't know if you guys know, I know you're a little young, but I got drafted. When I got drafted in New England, Coach Bill Parcells, was, he, he drafted me. He was the one that took a shot on, on, on the kid that left school early. Uh, I was, went to the University of Michigan. I decided to leave uh, school early for you know, personal and financial hardships at home, and I was taking a chance. And you know, I wasn't projected to go you know, in the first round. I was projected to go like fourth through seventh round, but I still said, you know, I'm going to take a chance and bet on myself like I always do. And I always hold a special place in my heart for Coach Parcells because he was the one and I wasn't the popular pick even with the Patriots at the time. Uh, I think they were wanting to go running back, but I think uh, Coach Parcells, from what I was told, that you know he, he, he pulled rank <laughs> and said, well, you know, we're going to draft this kid out of Michigan at the 23rd overall pick, so I'm going to always have a special place there. But he, he gave me a hard time, you know, you know, as the first round draft pick. And, and, and the reason I lead up to that story, uh, what I'm about to tell you is because Coach Parcells, he's a master at, you know, getting into your head, you know, manipulating you that way to see what in a good way, in a good way, in a good way to see to see what you're made of, and uh, you know, he's going to test you with every inch that he can, you know, and just to see if you're going to break. And he's always going to he's always trying to bring the best out of you. And because of where I come from, in Alaquipa, Pennsylvania, Western Pennsylvania, uh, you know, football was everything, and so I've heard every. I know uh, we can't say it, but I've heard every four-letter word that you could possibly call somebody <laughs> in, uh, you know, where I grew up. You know, that's just the way it was. So he used a lot of language and things like that to try to get up under your skin, and it worked. But if you couldn't handle that, if you couldn't handle that pressure, if you couldn't handle the way that, you know, he, he, he spoke to you, you know, it was going to be a long day, a long week, a long month, a long, a short career, you know, when it comes to uh, Coach Parcells. But when you're talking about Coach Belichick, and I think that's why they work so well together. Coach Belichick, he is the best, the absolute best that I've ever seen when it comes to game planning, the X's and O's about the strategic, the strategy and the, and the strategic planning, you know, for the next game. You never know what's going to come up next. You might, we might be in week, you know, eight, and we haven't seen anything. Like, like if we go back to a training camp, something that we haven't worked on at all, we might go back to something that we might have worked on you know, temporarily or surely in training camp. You know what I mean? And that's just the type of guy that Coach Belichick is. He's always preparing for the next game. And best believe he's going to put you in the best position for you to have success. So, you know, they were totally different coaches in, in, in a sense where he's going to get the best up out of you for maximum effort. It doesn't make a difference what's being called when I'm talking about Coach Parcell. Go out there, get the job done by any means necessary, you know, that's how he's approached it. Coach Belichick is I'm going to put you in the best position. They're going to run one, two, or three things out of this uh, situation and in, in this uh, formation. Hey, go out there and do it. But he's going to give you like that cheat sheet, you know, for 
uh, you to go out there and be successful. You just go out there, go out there and make the play. Park, Coach Parcells is not going to give you a cheat sheet. He's going to go out there and tell you, you better go do it or you're going to get fired. <laughs> <laughs> Um, how did those lessons help you, you know, obviously you talked about, you know, getting into businesses and everything like that. How did those lessons translate off the football field? I mean, it, it translates a lot because in business, I've always wanted to, uh, you know, work for myself, you know, at, when, I, when I got done playing. But I, things that I don't understand, I put into a football context so I will understand it. You know what I mean? So it's like teamwork commitment, you know, follow through, you know, um, knowing that you can't be successful without the team. I couldn't be successful without my off, uh, my, my defensive line up there rushing the passer. Uh, I couldn't be successful without Teddy Bruschi telling me, hey, Ty, this is what we're doing right now, you know, my linebackers. So I kind of took that approach in the business, knowing that it's, no matter what I got into, I've been playing football since I was seven years old, I, I uh, retired when I was 37 years old. So that's 30 straight years of football. Okay, what do I know besides football? I had to humble myself. I had to get good people around me that did things that's better than what I can do or know more than me. And I think that's the uh, part of being successful is surrounding yourself with like-minded people and not thinking you're the smartest guy in the room. And uh, so I've learned that by being an athlete, I know that I know what my job is, but I can't be successful with my job unless he is being successful with his job. And that's what I uh, carried into my businesses and what I do to this day. Awesome. All right, we're going to take some more questions from our students here. So go ahead and step up to the microphone, uh, state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead and ask your question. My name is Morris Corbett. I am also a, another student I from. I'm another student from uh, Akron North. My question is, how did your success change the relationships that you had? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I think, one, whether it's family or friends, uh, when you have success, that is going to show you, you know, who, you know, your real relationships are. And if you have a great relationship, if it's a relationship out of real love and trust, it shouldn't change whatsoever, no matter how much success you had. But when you start getting people to now to pay attention to you, now that they want to treat you different because you've had success, those are not your real friends, in, in, in my opinion. You know what I mean? So you just kind of keep those people at arm's reach. But the people that's been there for you from day one, as long as they don't change, uh, and no matter how much money you made, no, no matter how much success you've ha had personally, you know, that's your success and they should be happy for you. And, and, and so, you know, I, I always, you know, I put the antennas up when all of a sudden people start changing because of a certain accomplishment that I may have had or some set success or they feel like you got you know, financially okay, and they start changing. And those are the type of people that you may have to deal with them at some point, but you know, you keep those guys at arm's reach, but you know, your true relationships w should never have to change. And that's why, you know, I, some of my best friends to this day, even if we're not doing business or the people that have been with me and knew me from day one and they didn't change and they don't look at me as I've changed. And those are relationships that I keep the tightest. Awesome. All right, we're going to go ahead and take another question from a student. So go ahead and step up, state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead and ask your question here for Ty. My name is Julia Mock. I go to Holland High School, and my question is, what is your favorite moment from your NFL career and why? I saw a little video clip here in the intro that might, that might take, the, uh, take the answer here. What did you see? Let me see. I, I saw a little pick six. That pick six of like, Super Bowl? In the Super Bowl, that kind of was you important. You know what? I think that's the most memorable moment because um, of the significance of the game. We're in the Super Bowl. Um, we, we were playing against the uh, greatest show on turf, as they say, in, uh, in the St. Louis Rams. And by the time we got down to New Orleans, we wasn't supposed to be there. And it was, it was, it was all about the Pittsburgh Steelers who we beat in the championship game. But even the NFL assumed that Pittsburgh was down there because by the time we got to New Orleans, we still had Pittsburgh Steelers chocolates and 
stuff in the hotel. It was all about the Steelers. No one gave the Patriots a chance. So when you're talking about being able to make that play to kind of get the game uh, swung our way, you know, that was a huge play, you know, in my career. That's the most that, – that's the play that everyone – knows about, especially in New England, when they're talking about me, the, you know, the hand in the air, all that good stuff. But for me, it was the, the, the game that stands out is the AFC Championship game to get to the Super Bowl uh, the year after when we went to play, uh, I think it was Carolina. You know, I had three interceptions in, uh, in, in the AFC Championship game and uh, off of Peyton Manning. So that right there was – like like the moment for me that was like I, I felt like I couldn't lose you know it's just one of those games where you're in the zone and you don't get it that often and you know fortunately for me I was on the receiving end of three <laughs> three uh, Peyton Manning passes and you know it led us to the Super Bowl and that's when we get our second Super Bowl so you know that one always going to stand out for me of course you had you know in the 15 years you had moments but that always stood out, but everyone says what you says, and they will say the Super Bowl, and I and I get it, and I understand. I think one of the coolest things, and we, you know, the, I don't think it gets talked about enough, is you know, once everybody's in the Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. you just mentioned it because it's what made me think of it. You know, you mentioned picking off Peyton Manning three times. When Peyton Manning walks into that room with all you guys, uh -huh. do you bring that up, or <laughs> is there is just is this a little is a little you know friendly trash talk back and forth, you know, reminiscing on careers. And, you know, because at the end of the day, everybody, you know, there's oh, such no, a no, huge we're, we're, level of right. respect. Yeah, it's always a huge level of respect. How brothers. does that relationship, you know, how, how cool is that actually, for you to sit down and talk? Actually, shop? it was funny that this, uh, uh, it was, you know, the year before last, well, I was at, a, a, at an after party for, uh, it was Hutch, you know, when he got in. So, you know, I was, I was talking to Peyton and he wanted to introduce me uh, to his mom, of course, I've known uh, uh, Archie for a while. Been he'd been over to a few Pro Bowls, and you know, was a former player mm -hmm. himself. But I finally got a chance to meet uh, Peyton's mom, and he was like, "Hey, mom, this is uh, uh, Ty Law." Uh, you know, he was like, "Is this the guy who keeps intercepting you?" I mean, you can see where <laughs> you can see where his personality and, and everything comes from. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Is like, and he just walked away. He's like, "Okay, thanks, mom." You know what I mean? But it's like. We have such a, a, a strong connection, even though we competed against mm -hmm. each other. But, you know, we're all a part of the same fraternity, not just the Hall of Fame, but just the NFL. You know, we're brothers. I mean, we, 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 we compete. We're not friends on Sunday. But typically, after it's all said and done, even when we go play in Pro Bowls, you know what I mean? It's like we're, we're on the same team now. Mm -hmm. And, and it, that mutual respect is always there. But if you can jab them every now and again, <laughs> you know, that's the part of it. You know, that's the part of that competition that still – uh, is within all of us. We just can't run, throw, you know, catch, tackle no more. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. But we're going to let you, you know, especially if the situation happens to arise, you know, we're going to let you know that, remember, I got you on this one. I remember, <laughs> you know, people still remind me about LaDainian and Tommy. They, like, you know, how they say in basketball, he broke your ankles. LaDainian and Tommy broke my ankles one day. I was with New York. He put a move on to me. I was like, man, you know, he <laughs> broke my ankles. So he let me know every now and again what he did to me. So it's all in good fun and – you know, competition, but at, like I said, at the end of the day, we have a brotherhood and there's so much, so much respect, respect there. That's awesome. All right, we'll take another question from one of our students in the back. So go ahead and step up, state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead and ask your question. Hi, my name is Isabella Musali and I go to Howland High School. And my question is, when adversity struck, where did you go to regain your confidence? Question. Good question. Thanks. So when adversity struck, then we came to confidence. For me, it's like uh, because the position that I played. Are you talking about just in football or life? I think. It, I mean, I think either one. You know, I think. Huh? It, like, I think it could apply to. to okay. Either one. So when it came to, uh, let me. Uh, so let me give you a two-part. You know, answer to that. Let me first of all let's talk about the sport. You know, in football, when I feel like adversity struck. You know, with, with, with football, I didn't perform like I needed to perform or I feel like I should have performed or if I let my team down uh, with the performance. I had to dig deep. I had to, I mean, I, I was the type of guy to just get in my car, throw on some music. I didn't want to be, you know, around anybody. And I had to dig deep within myself because on certain situations, there's no one that you can turn to that can help you out there to help me out there on the field. You know, there was a lot of times that I felt like I was a boxer, you know, uh, even though I wasn't playing a team sport, but I'm individually out there, 
you know, uh, trying to cover the best wide receiver week in and week out because that was part of my job. So I had to dig deep because I couldn't go to nobody to talk me into playing uh, better who can relate to what I'm talking about because you're not out here. You're not asked to deal with this responsibility. So, you know, it was always an internal thing that I had to, you know, figure out. And whatever my process was, whether getting in the car, I would just ride, not going nowhere, just getting into my own head and say, you know, you can't let this happen. I'll go back to the film room. What did I do wrong? So it was a lot of self-evaluation. But when it came to, you know, my, uh, you know, my personal uh, life, when things got bad, I would, before my grandfather passed, you know, I always had him to talk to. He always brought me back to where I needed to be. Um, so uh, that was that was huge to have a, a you know a, a father figure, an influence like my like my grandfather, you know, and th he he taught me how to how to be a man. He told me how to take a step back. Everything that I that I am that I know before he passed, he passed along uh, to me. You know, I didn't have my biological father. Uh, in my life, you know, at the time. So my grandfather stepped in in a big way and, and, and told me right from wrong. So he was always, I mean, always, always, always that, you know, person for me. You know, kind of following up on that, how important is it to have those people? You know, you, for, so for example, you know, on the field, you kind of took everything in. Right. You know, you, I, I get that, you know, getting in your car and just going nowhere. Right. It's just a way to, you know, some people golf, some people go hunt and sit in the right. tree stand, some people just ride in their car to, right. to kind of like right. debrief. But, you know, when you go through rough patches, how important is it to have that support system, whether it's a coach, a teammate, a parent, a grandparent, how important is it to have those people behind you? I think it's, uh, you know, it's very important and, you know, and it's fortunate if you do have some, you know, people like that, it's, um, but it's also, I know friends that didn't have that support system, but I mean, having a friend or somebody that you can trust and talk to, they might not have, they don't have to be a professional. They don't, they might not even have to be on your level, you know, uh, but to have somebody that you can trust. And that's the hard part is finding people that you can really trust, confide in that's gonna not judge you and things like that. So, you know, I felt, you know, free no matter what my flaws were you know, when it came to my, my grandfather and, you know, certain mentors that you can be vulnerable and not be the tough guy, not be the football player that's supposed to have all the answers, you know what I mean? So I think it's very important in life to surround yourself with people, you know, that, that you can trust, that you can lean on and, and, and look at you as just for who you are, whatever your name is, just looked at me as, you know, not Ty Law, they just looked at me as Tawan which is my birth name, guys, is Tawan. So, you know, I, I, you know, just to have somebody in my corner that say, okay, that's just Tawan or that's just Ty, not Ty Law, is very, very uh, important. Awesome. All right, we'll take some more questions from the back. So go ahead and snag whoever's up next. Go ahead and step up to the microphone. State your name, the school you go to. He's wearing red, so I'm going to guess where he goes to school. Yep. And then go ahead and ask your question. And I go to Brookside Middle School. My question is, who influenced you the most in your life, and how or why did that person do it? One, I will go back to my grandfather again. He said he was my biggest, my biggest uh, fan, my biggest advocate for anything, and you know he was there for me. I, I can say that I probably wouldn't be sitting here in front of you guys right now if it wasn't for my grandfather to keep me on, on the straight and narrow to show me uh, what life was because I. I grew up around, you know, it was a tough, it was a tough neighborhood, you know what I mean? I love my, my hometown with, with all my heart, but it was pretty tough, you know, from the uh, drugs and violence and the people, you know, tend to, you know, veer the other way. So, you know, he kept me grounded uh, in that. Like I said, he was that voice of reason of why I shouldn't do this, why I shouldn't do that. And he gave me an example of, hey, if you do it the right way, you won't end up dead or in jail like and, and there's plenty of examples to look at when it came to sport i had the opportunity guys to spend my summers with tony dorsett was my uncle who i was telling you about and that there you know changed my life big time it's at least my thought process saying not only was my grandfather showing me the way of doing things the right way to see what you can accomplish through the sport that i love so much not saying that i would ever be tony dorsett but I loved it. If you work hard and you're passionate about it, this dream's 
can become reality. So just getting to spend a couple weeks in Dallas, Texas uh, every summer uh, for a few years, it really was a big time motivator for me to be able to sit there and talk to a Hall of Famer, to live like, oh, hell, I've never seen a pool in the ground at that time. I mean, he had an in the ground pool. The only time I seen that is at the public pool where I grew up. <laughs> you know, when you seen one in the ground, if, it, if somebody had in their yard, it was that kind that you, you big bathtub. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just, sit on the, just sitting on the back and that's what your swimming pool was. So I was able to experience, you know, things like that. And that just motivated me to want to keep going and keep going and keep going to see how far I can take this thing. And I always wanted to be a professional football player. So I have to say Tony Dorsett was a major, major influence in my life, you know, and he, and I don't think he knew it until, you know, my Hall of Fame speech when I had to let him know personally what he meant for me. And, you know, you know, not every day, you know, not everybody has an uncle who's a Hall of Famer, so right. to have that mm -hmm. support system is, mm -hmm. is huge, and you know, just from that short part there, you can tell how much of an influence mm -hmm. he had, and, you know, you mentioned it a few times, you know, knowing where you, you, you came from, hearing your enshrinement speech, talking so much about Alex Bupa, you know, why why is that you know your home your home city so important to you and, and what's that community like you know here in Ohio we're reaching state finals in football mm -hmm. you know you know football high school football mm -hmm. is at the, its peak right now in right. the state so you know growing up and you know playing high school football in that city what was that community that upbringing like for you it, it was it was everything because you know outside of that it seemed like that was the only time guys that the the, the drugs the violence killing, the shooting, whatever that might be going on, that's the only time that it stops. That's the only time where you can sit there and really have peace of mind and saying, hey, this is Friday night. No one's going to get into anything. This is the football. You know what I mean? And that's just the way it was growing up. You know, I see this show, the Friday night lights, and they talk about Texas, and that's where it's at. No, that's, that's Pennsylvania. That's Ohio. That's, that's right here in our little bucket. You know, and you think about, you know, the guys that's, in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, you know, Pennsylvania and Ohio <laughs> make up a lot of them. You know what I mean? So it, the, the football is just not Texas, Florida, California. This is a football hub, but that was our getaway, you know, and that was that was being in the pros where I grew up as a little leaguer, uh, you know, seven, eight years old, starting playing. The goal was to eventually play on Friday night for Alcoma High School. They were our professional athletes, and so it meant everything you know, to be able to represent your city, to, you know, show out for the guys that that, 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 that preceded you, you know what I mean, that puts the pressure on you. Because I'm telling you, if you lose, oh, you have grandmas and everybody cussing you out. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like, oh, yeah, yeah, it ain't worth a damn. You know what I mean? That's just how it is because you are expected to win. But I loved it, and it, and it helped mold me to, to this day. And even when I went to the University of Michigan, I loved my school, you know, my alma mater, but – if you ever watch Monday night football, Thursday night, Sunday night, wherever we play on national TV, you know how they used to say, hey, you tell where you're from, just like you guys going up there saying what school you're from. I've never said the University of Michigan not one time in 15 years because Al Quipper was so near and dear to my heart that every time I said Ty Law cornerback, I said Al Quipper High School. It was no disrespect to the University of Michigan, but, you know, I'm, I'm Al Quipper Quip through and through, even, you know, as far as the Patriots, you know, if you ask me, what do I bleed? I bleed red and black from Aliquippa. I don't bleed red and blue from the Patriots, you know what I mean? And, and because without Aliquippa, I wouldn't be here in the position I am right now. You know, you mentioned your alma mater a few times, and as much as it pains me to say, being an Ohio <laughs> State fan, you know, going to the University of Michigan, being in that rivalry, which is, you know, I'm a little biased, I assume right. you are as well, but I think it's the, the, the greatest rivalry in all of sports. Absolutely. What was it like being a part of that? You know, seeing, you know, the successes that you had in college when you were there and then now seeing the rivalry today, obviously we're looking at, mm -hmm. you know, pretty much another semifinal playoff game right. that's going to happen yeah. here in a couple of weeks. I mean, it was huge. And, and, and the crazy part, I didn't realize the rivalry, even when I was getting recruited out of high school, Michigan was actually, you know, the last the last two raw. I was planning on going to ACC, but I really, and I said, I was going to take my last official visit to Ohio State. I said, okay, I got one more left. Let me go on there. One of my buddies from high school was playing there. I'm going to go. And they begged me. And I'm like, it's just a visit. I said, I'm going to come to Michigan, but I'm going to take my last trip. You know, and they just, and they started giving me all the history and just his emotions and attitude when it came to me going to take that visit. Like, 
it was going to be the end of the world. I'm like, okay, all right, I'll, I'll just stay and just go to go to Michigan. But I, I, I kind of understood right then that it was deep. And by the time I got up to, you know, Ann Arbor and going to school there, it was like we were preparing for, it seemed like we were preparing for Ohio State and we had played them at the end of the season. And vice versa, because you know one of my buddies was a starting safety at Ohio State that went to Alacoqua, and he was saying, "Oh, it's all about this." You know, he was there a couple years before me, but I did not understand. But now that I do, and to be a part of that is it, something special. And, and and we have a lot of respect for one another, just like you know uh, in the pros, whether you're playing Peyton, Tom, and mm -hmm. hey, it's it's a mutual respect with Michigan, Ohio State. We can't stand each other on Saturday. Let, let's, let's, let's make that oh, yeah, clear. I'll be honest, we yeah. <laughs> cannot stand each other on end. But after that, you know, the, 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 Eddie, the Eddie Georges I played with, you know, the uh, late great uh, uh, Ter Terry Glenn and Joey Galloway's. I mean, we're all friends until Saturday. You know what I mean? And, uh, and, and it is absolutely the greatest rivalry in, in, in college football, mm -hmm. in my opinion, to be a part of that. I was 1-1-1 one, one, one in my three years. You know, they're one, one, lost one, tied one. You know, uh, uh, unfortunately, I, uh, I didn't get to play that fourth to break, break through that tie. Hopefully, they got another win. But, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of the rivalry. Not a huge fan of Ohio State, you know. But if it was, let me put it this way. If, if it was a championship, and because it's Big Ten, we're still, you know, still somewhat of a family. If Michigan's not in it, then Ohio State has an opportunity you know, to, to, to win, you know, I might lean towards, not cheer, but I might lean <laughs> towards the Buckeyes to win because it's all part of the Big Ten family. Awesome. And, you know, talk about how, you know, stories and careers come full circle. Your first sack in the NFL was on none other than the current head coach of the University of Michigan, John Harbaugh. Yes. Why are you Jim telling Harbaugh? them my no, age, man? I'm sorry. 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 <laughs> um, Jim Harbaugh, yes. excuse me. Um, so obviously at the time you had no idea how things were going to pan out, right. but, but, you know, there's just, it's just one example of so many different mm -hmm. stories on how folks careers come full circle. So to be a part of one of those small stories. Oh yeah, like, absolutely. My, and my son, he's a freshman now at uh, university of Michigan, but I had to uh, let coach Harbaugh know that, you know, that, Hey, you know, you was my first sack, <laughs> you know, when I, when I finally got to, uh, you know, meet him and all that. I had to, you know, that's the thing we do. We throw that little dig in there, you know, just to let him know. But, you know, Coach Harbaugh, he was a, uh, a you know, great, great player. He knew of college and the pros, had a long career. And uh, now, you know, he's doing well at the University of Michigan. I'm glad that he stayed. Uh, you know, he, he put the program back where it needs to be. And hopefully we're, you know, get us a national championship or keep competing for a national championship. So, you know, I'm happy that my son decided to follow in my footsteps and go to school there because, it's not just about football, it's about education. And both Michigan and Ohio State are great educational institutions, man. So, you know, the Big Ten is they're, they're in um, they're in full swing. I got a question here coming from the, yeah. the live stream. I'm kind of going back to Aliquippa. Okay. Uh, Daryl Revis, first year eligibility to be in the Hall of Fame this year. Um, played together with the mm -hmm. Jets in 2008, both from Aliquippa. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you talked about you know, player yeah. after player coming out of there, but you know, how cool was it to see him succeed? Oh, and, and how bad would you want him to have that gold jacket just like you did? Oh, man, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of win for Darrell Rivas because he's going to get the gold jacket. He, he, he absolutely deserves it. Uh, being from Aliquippa and, you know, the, the lineage of people, uh, Mike Dicker uh, was uh, first, then Tony Dorsett, now myself, and Darrell Rivas a couple years after me. And, you know, I, I really believe that he should be a first ballot. You know, Hall of Famer, but you know, I'm not a voter. I just you know have my voice of Hall of Fame. But hey, this guy was the real deal, and for us to both be from Aliquippa, him looking up, you know, to me when I came in, you know what I mean. Also wearing the number 24, for us to be able to play together because I had an opportunity to go back uh, to New England, and you know we were in, in in the negotiations, and you know what I was already there. You know I had to. You know, I had the, uh, you know, the three rings in the 10 years and, you know, the championships. But I said, this is an opportunity to go back. And I'm on, I'm on the swan song of my career. I'm on, I'm on my way out. <laughs> so I'm like, two guys from Aliquippa on the start on the corners, 12 years apart. I got to take advantage of that. I got to go down. Plus, Eric Mangini, uh, 
you know, he was my defensive back coach mm -hmm. at, uh, at the Patriots. So I had the opportunity to go play with Darrell Revis. So to have two Alec Cooper boys, you know, man in the corners at, at one time, like I said, 12 years apart, you know, he was on the come up, I was on the way out. And now for it to come full circle, and he ended up going to the Patriots for a year and getting a championship, you know, I, and I helped facilitate that as well, you know what I mean, for him to go there and get his championship. And, you know, he was a hired assassin, one of the best to ever do it. And now to be in a position and will eventually get into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, this is going to be not only big for him, his family, but big for our community in Aliquippa because everything is about – community you see how many people came out you know for me mm -hmm. right up the street I'm talking about bus loads and <laughs> bus loads and bus loads of people it's going to be the same thing for Darrell Revis and you know I'm excited for him uh, I'm excited for him hopefully I get to go and surprise him and do the knock again because it would only be it, it would only be right if I was to do it so I'm putting it out there right now <laughs> I got to be the one to knock on that door you know, for Darrell Reavers when he gets in. Uh, you mentioned that you got the opportunity to do that for Richard Seymour this year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to receive the knock yourself. Right. To then be able to give the knock. What was that moment like for you? And, you know, how do you balance on, you know, the reward factor? Like, was that more rewarding than getting the knock and, and being able to do that for somebody else? You know what? I mean, to, to get the knock because that's what you've been waiting for. Mm -hmm. And you got to realize that I wasn't one of, you know, the guys that got the knock the first time I went out. I had to wait. So, I mean, it was, it, was, it was a little more special when you never know when you're sitting there waiting. I got in on my, on my third opportunity uh, to get in. But all that's out the window when you finally get in. But, you know, you're waiting for that knock for um, David Baker. But that was his thing. And, I, and with, with the new uh, president uh, of the Hall of Fame and because of the pandemic and they, had some, and they had some success, you know, with, you know, showing up at people's house. Of course, you have to plan it with the family and all that. That was, that's the hard part. But I had a personal relationship with uh, Richard and his wife, Tanya. Um, and like I said, we have the same, you know, same financial advisors mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So it was, it was, it was kind of an easy transition, but to be able to give him that knock, him unknowingly what was going on and me showing up with the gold jacket, I think that is a staple from here, from, like for years to come. I mean, it should always be like that because when another Hall of Famer, being that is such a exclusive fraternity, when another Hall of Famer knocks on your door and brings you in, I think it makes it that much more special, especially somebody that you know. So I was honored to be able to do that for Richard as a as a brother. You know, we won Super Bowls together as personal friends, and uh, I think it has to stay that way. It has to stay that way. Cause that, cause that's what I think is more memorable like that coming from Hall of Famer to a Hall of Famer. It's definitely cool to see the, the you talked about the brotherhood so much, the relationships right. uh, that are created through the game of football for mm -hmm. sure. Uh, we got time here for a couple more questions. So we're going to send it back here to our students for our next question. So students, whoever's up next, go ahead, step up to the microphone, state your name, the school you go to. I think he's got red on too. And then go ahead uh -huh. and ask your question. Uh, my name is Alex Era. I go to Brookside Middle School. And when did you know that you had to walk away from the game? What's that transition like, <sighs> walking away? Man, you know what? I got to say it again. Y'all pulling some good questions out today. Like, when did I know it was right? Because you know what? <laughs> I knew because of the way my body felt. But sometimes you don't listen because this is what you do. This is what I did, you know, for a living. This is the game that I love. But I knew it was time to walk away when I kept – you know, getting injured. I've never had a hamstring, and, and I thought of everybody, a hamstring? No, oh, man, you saw it. Ain't it. You know, because I never had a hamstring. In 15 years, year 15, I start, you know, back started hurting, which I got to have a surgery now, you know, in a, in a couple of weeks still from my playing days, but I start pulling hamstrings, and I just wasn't the same player. And as hard as it is to admit, that you know what, you just don't have it no more to play at the level that you're accustomed to playing to. I had to start listening to myself and, and my body and that's what uh, really did it. I, have, I had an opportunity to come back the next year uh, after um, I, my last season shut it down. Even the whole season went by, I got a call again because people thought I was in pretty decent shape to come back and maybe help someone. But you know, if I couldn't play at the level that I'm accustomed to playing with, that there was no way I was going to go back on the field. I didn't want to be at the end of my career being a journeyman, jumping from team to team, you know, for, for what? And uh, my body 
told me that it's time to move on because everything is physical. If you can't run, if you can't uh, jump, if you can't cover, you know, and help your team, it's, it's time to go. And that's what happened to me. It, it was time to go from a physical standpoint. Mentally, I felt like I was still sharp enough to play, but physically, I couldn't do it anymore. You know, you, you can probably, you would have went out there and you could probably beat me and outrun me at that time <laughs> when I was trying to shut it down. <laughs> All right, we'll I go to recognize that. We'll go to another question from our students in the back. So go ahead and step up to the mic, state your name. Uh, looks like we got another Brookside Cardinal. Brookside Cardinal. Brookside uh, go Cardinal, ahead okay. and ask uh, your question. My name's Brian Alvall, and I go to Brookside. Well, my question is, what was, what was it like growing up with Tony Dorsett as your uncle? You talked about Tony and his impact, but you know, did you know as seven-year-old Ty that your uncle was Tony Dorsett, the great running no, back of the Cowboys? All I heard back then was that's the next Tony Doris said, the next Tony Doris. Of course, you know, we're sitting around on every Thanksgiving, you know, looking at the, because uh, he went to, you know, high school with my dad and, uh, you know, my mom. But, you know, by the time I, I got to him in the summertime, you know, I just knew of him. I seen him around, but I didn't get the relationship like that until I started going with my cousin Anthony, his son, and I started going down there from the eighth grade. So all prior to that, he was just, much of a myth and a legend because he was busy living his life as anything else. Of course, I was with my cousin Anthony when he come spend some summers, you know, there. But then as we got older, start chasing our dream, you know, we got to go down there when, when Anthony moved to Dallas, you know, when he was living with his mom before, then he moved to Dallas with his dad. And that's when I started coming down. And that's when it really, he really had the impact, you know, on me to be able to sit there and, and talk being able to work out with him. I'm working out with Dallas Cowboys, you know, Everson Walls and Eugene Lockhart, Tony Hill, uh, you know, the late Ron Springs. I'm just, you know, Ken Norton. You know, I'm just like, wow, the guys I see on TV, I'm actually, you know, working out. I'm running stadium stairs and just trying to keep up. So that was a huge, huge uh, influence on me. So from then on, I was looking forward to every summer. I knew I had to have my grades right because if, if I didn't have my grades right, my grandfather was not going to let me go down and spend, you know, that that two weeks down in Dallas. You know what I mean? So, you know, I had to do everything right just for that because I did not want to miss that experience, and I look forward to it every year. And, and like I said, for four years in a row, that was a major, major, major influence on me wanting to be a professional, you know, athlete and a football player, um, wanting to do better for my family to be able to, you know, Get us, get us, get us a nicer home, and that's the things you dream about, you know, when you're a kid. And I was able to, I was able to do that, you know, through him. Awesome. All right, we're gonna got time for one more question from the back. So go ahead, and step up, state your name, the school you go to, and then go ahead and ask your question. I go to Cam McKinley High School. So my question for you is, if you could, if you could have played with any other Hall of Famer, who would be your choice? Oh, man. Any other Hall of Famer. Anytime. Anytime, any other Hall of Fame. Let me see. Man. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm stumped. I'm, I'm stumped now because it's funny that we talk about who we would love to uh, play with. I give you an example like, now I played with him in Pro Bowls, but myself and Ray Lewis, we could imagine if oh we would have been able to play with each other. <laughs> <laughs> you know, during a regular season, like just every week, week in and week out. And we had a great time. And that's when you say, man, I wish I could play with you all the time when you're playing in these Pro Bowls, you know, uh, like Steve Atwater. But if I had to take someone back in the day and play two of us on the corner, how would they throw the ball? I would like to play with uh, Deion Sanders because I know – and selfishly, I know I'm probably going to get a lot of stats because they ain't going to throw at him, they ain't going to throw at me. <laughs> so I'm, there I'm looking at I'm I'm, 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 I'm going to pick it off. You know, I'm going to have 10, 11 in the year, but they'll be scared of him. So I would say Deion Sanders, you know, and just be able to play at that level. And, you know, you could not throw the football. I was like, it was no way that you play to throw the football. So I would say Deion Sanders, if I had to play behind somebody, mean Joe Green. Ooh. You know the ball coming out fast, <laughs> so you can jump on something there. So I would say Mean Joe Green as well. So yeah, I don't don't think there's a wrong answer. Yeah, when, exactly. When you're looking at yeah, that. Exactly. Um, got time for a couple more. I want to flash back, you know, to the beginning of your career. You know, coming out of college, like you said, you kind of that mid-round, you know, 
mm-hmm. took a risk on yourself. What was your welcome to the NFL moment? What was that moment to where you realized, like, all right, this is different than college? Um, well, I happened to be my first game starting. I think it was the second game of the season you know, versus Atlanta. My welcome to the NFL moment is when I tried to show out and run up on Craig Ironhead Hayward. I know you guys are a little young, but <laughs> those of you who are not, I tried to run up on him because on film, you know, and I, what we say, eye in the sky don't lie. Yeah, I was lying to myself <laughs> because I ran up on him. He went straight over me, and I think he was probably like 250, 60-pound running back. And, you know, like I said, I was just trying to show out my first game starting and did not make a smart decision <laughs> trying to hit him, hide his chest. Like, like I was really going to do some damage. He did more – I did more damage to myself than to him. So, that's when you say, uh, hey, you always play – you got to play smarter, not harder when it comes to certain things. And that was my uh, welcome to the NFL. You know, and, and like I said, he's gone, rest in peace. Uh, but he was, a, you know, a hell of a running back. And, and he put it on me. That, that, that was a highlight that I – a low light that I like to forget. Uh, for those so Iron Hayward is the father – Cam Hayward and his brother, who are both on the Steelers, so right. that lineage lives on. Oh yeah, in the exactly. NFL for yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. That that is right. That is awesome. Yeah, because but he was a hard guy to bring down, guys. You know, you don't you don't want to tackle him straight up. My advice for you DBs: go low, hit the legs. Don't don't hit a big guy up here. Do damage to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> um, last question here today, and this is how we wrap up every program. It's just a good way to kind of send send everybody out with with a with a message. Um, talked a lot of great things today, you know, about your career both on and off the field. But if there's one piece of advice, that one nugget of information you want somebody to leave here with today, if it's the only thing they remember, what's that one piece of advice, that one nugget of information you want them to leave with? Well, one is to stay true to yourself and follow your follow. I mean, really believe in yourself and follow your. That's always my message to the people: is to believe in yourself. Because I had a lot of people tell me what I could and couldn't do. What I, will, what I would and wouldn't accomplish. So believing in yourself is first and foremost, and be committed to that, like we said earlier. Commit to believing in yourself and not faltering, because you're gonna have your ups and downs, but I believe me, if you commit to it, and you work hard within that commitment, and you really believe in yourself and what you're doing, you're gonna land somewhere successful. That's why I always say, hey, shoot for the moon. Yeah, let, hopefully we get there. But if you land amongst the stars, you'll be successful. So that is my point of anything that I do. One, believing in yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, it doesn't make a difference what anybody else thinks. You know, because you don't believe it. You know, I can believe that you're great. But if you don't believe it, what is my words saying? If I say that you're not great and you believe that you are, you, you, I'm nobody proved me wrong. But that's all that matters. So, you know, I encourage everyone to stay true to themselves, believe in yourself, work hard to accomplish whatever you're going to work. Don't let whatever happens that might not be a part of the plan stop you from achieving your goals. And that's how I was able to have success both on and off the field. And I want to carry that, you know, to my next venture, knowing that it's not going to be easy, but I'm going to believe in myself and Hopefully, uh, something successful will happen after that as well. Awesome. Well, with that, we're going to wrap up this installment of the Pro Football Hall of Fame's Heart of a Hall of Famer series, connected by Extreme Hall of Famer. Thank you, guys. Ty, thank you so much for everything you do for us here at the Hall of Fame. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time. Let me put the hat on right there.